there is one of five ways that you can solve a quadratic equation. Now we'll get into the details of how we do the square root method, but one of the things I want to do here first is let's let's go ahead and talk about there are five methods for solving a quadratic equation, and let's list these. So this is going to be our major topic here, and really it's the the most it's the biggest topic that we talk about in Algebra 2. We said the biggest skill that we learn is factoring, but the biggest topic is solving a quadratic equation. Now, let's list here the methods for solving a quadratic equation. So we've already talked about one of these in our previous video, and that would have been factoring. Okay, so we're going to talk about a little bit more about this today also. So factoring. Now, the second one here that we're going to list is going to be the square root method, the one that we're going to do today. We have square root method. So by hopefully by the end of the video here, we'll know how to solve them. We'll have solved them by factoring in the square root method. And one thing we're going to look at is which problems do I use the factoring method and which ones do I use for the square root method. So you can't always use both methods here. And that's the thing about quadratic equations with five methods. You have to approach the problem with the correct method. Now, let's go ahead and look at the other three methods here. Okay, And these methods, I'm not going to teach them to you today, but I want you to go ahead and learn the names for them here. And so we'll get to these methods uh, later on this week and early next week. Okay, so the third method here that we're going to look at is going to be graphing. And, and we'll, what we'll do with this is probably use a graphing calculator to solve them by graphing. Now, the thing about graphing here is the only way I let you use graphing is really only to check. It's only to check the solutions. And we'll actually look at solving by graphing tomorrow. Now, the other methods are completing the square. And I'm not really going to get into details about what that is. We'll probably get to that around Friday or so, or Thursday. And then number five, the quadratic formula. Okay, so you may have heard someone mention before about what the quadratic formula is. There's a poster that's on the door that has it. You don't have to really copy it down yet because it's not really meaningful yet. Now, let's focus on the square root method, okay? Now, the first thing I want us to look at with the square root method is not necessarily how, but when, okay? So, you know, let's really answer this question, all right? When do I use the square root method, okay, versus factoring? because this is the only two methods that we're talking about. So we'll expand this list later when we talk about the other three methods. So when do I use the square root method? And when do I use factoring? Okay, now it's really about one thing and that is the linear term. So recall here that you know if we have an equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, that this is the quadratic term the middle term is called the linear term, and now that's the one we're really going to focus on. And then C is called the constant term. Okay, so there again, if you didn't remember that, write that down. The B part, the BX, the one with the X term, is called the linear term. Okay, so when do I use the square root method? Here's the answer to that. When there's no linear term. Okay, so if the linear term is missing in my problem, this is when I'm going to use the square root method. Now, factoring, so it's sort of the opposite answer. I'm going to use factoring when there is a linear term. Okay, so when we get to some problems later, you're going to have to decide here, which method do I use? Do I use the square root method? Or do I use factoring to solve that quadratic equation? So the answer to that 
is whether or not your equation has a linear term. So if it has a linear term, we're going to use factoring. If I don't have a linear term, then we're going to use the square root method. Now we've already talked about factoring, so hopefully you've done those problems and solved those by factoring. Now let's look at the square root method. Okay, so now I'm going to look at a lot of examples here. You can look at this in your book on page 264 that or use the square root method. Now, chances are you've actually done the square root method before when you solve problems with the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, but let's take a look at this one. And so the, the idea here with the square root method is all you really want to do is just this, is you want to isolate x squared. Okay, and then the next thing here is just you want to take the square root on both sides, and that's to undo the square part. Okay, now be sure let's understand that we have to isolate x squared first, though. Okay, some people want to take the square root on both sides when a little bit too early. The x squared needs to be by itself before we do that. Now, let's actually look at this problem here, and I'm going to introduce this review concept of the principal root as we go here. All right, so first thing, let's isolate x squared. So the first thing I would do here was would be add would be to add 180 to both sides. So I'm not going to show it. I'm just going to take it over there. And so if I added it over there to 0, it would be positive. Okay, now I don't want to take the square root of both sides yet. There again, because x squared is not isolated. So now what I want to do is isolate x squared, so I'm going to divide by 5 on both sides. So I get x squared. And now when you take a calculator and do 180 divided by 5, that's going to give me, I think that's 36. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Now at this point, we're going to do the square root on both sides. Now, I'm just going to do this. All right. But before I say that answer is 6, because that is actually one of the answers, let's go to this, this thing I have on the right side here about reviewing what a principal root was. So you remember the idea behind a principal root is the result had to be positive. If you want to write that down, you can here. Okay, so result was always positive. Okay, now when, when I took the square root right there of both sides, because I introduced the radical symbol, even though it's a radical symbol and it's an even root, these roots right here, these are not principal roots. Okay, so my answer here does not have to be positive. And so if I was looking for all the real square roots of 36, it would not only be 6, but it would also be negative 6. And there again, let's look how that works. Okay, let me, let me go ahead and write my answer, and then we're going to bump this down and show you here. So my answer is going to be a positive and negative 6, so you use a, what's called a plus or a minus sign. And so let's kind of look how that works. Let's go back to uh, a certain part here. Let me squeeze this in. Okay, so what I had before that was this. And so we could ask our question, our question this way. What number could I square to get 36? Well, sure enough, you know, you could square 6 and you could get 36. But you could also square negative 6 and get 36. And so that's why we say our solution here is not just 6, but plus or minus 6. Okay. So now here's really the bottom line. If, you, you know, if you're confused with this, this is all you really have to remember. If I take the square root of both sides, that next result has to say plus or minus. Okay, maybe want to write that down. Okay, again, if we take the square root on both sides, then that result that I get from it is going to have a plus or a minus sign on it. Okay, so there again, what we did on both sides, we took the square root, and that square root is, since I'm doing it, the, the, it's not on the paper. I'm, I'm writing the square root symbol. 
that means it's not a principal root. So I can get a positive or a negative result. And what you're going to find with quadratics is most of the time they're going to have two solutions. Now, let's look at this next one here. Okay, so there again, we're going to isolate x squared. So I'm going to take 25 and add it over here. And so that's going to make it positive 25. Now, what people kind of do here is they jump the gun. They see those nice, perfect squares of 4 and 25, and they want to take the square root of both sides. But that's not really the appropriate step here. Again, I have to isolate x squared. So what I have to do is get rid of the 4 there. So I'm going to divide by 4 on both sides. Now, 25 is not going to divide by 4 evenly. So I'm just going to leave it as a fraction. And also notice that it doesn't reduce either. So now that it's x squared is isolated, now I'm going to take the square root on both sides. Now, that's probably going to puzzle you with a fraction. Now, when I do a fraction, all I really have to do is just make sure I do the square root of the numerator and the denominator. Okay. Now, what some people will do is they'll show it like this. Now, I'm going to erase and kind of put it back like I had it. Some people will do it like that. Now, the way I do that is to make it a little bit kind of clearer to you is just to do the numerator and the denominator. Now that works out pretty good because they're both perfect squares. And so the square root there of 25 is five, and then the square root of four there is two. So I'm gonna get five over two, but recall, I took the square root on both sides. So it's not just five over two, it would be plus or minus five over two. Okay, let's look now at example um, 2b. Now, so to isolate x squared on this one, all I have to do is just divide by 3. 24 divided by 3 is going to give me 8. Okay, so that one divides out pretty nicely. Now we're going to get rid of the square. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the square root on both sides. And so when I do the square root of 8 here, notice 8 is not a perfect square. Now I have to put it in simplest form. So we're going to think, how could we simplify 8? You've got to know how to simplify square roots. We say 4 times 2. And so that would simplify to 2 square roots of 2. Now recall, I took the square root on both sides. So my answer is not just 2 square roots of 2, but it would be plus or minus 2 square roots of 2. Okay, I think I'm going to... I'm going to skip over to C. All right, and I'm going to include another one here that's not in your textbook, 2D. Okay, they really don't give you anything in this lesson like this one, but they do in the next lesson. So let's go through this one. And so notice here that you have 5x squared and then minus 3, but there's no linear term. And if we recall, I probably should have pointed this out while we were doing these. Okay, go back to 2A. It was 4x squared minus 25, okay? There was, there was no linear term. And so this is why I'm using the square root method. See, if I have a linear term, I'm not going to be able to use the square root method. All right, same thing here. There was no linear term. There was no plain x term. Now, same thing here. So let's isolate x squared now. Let's take 3 over. So we'd add 3 to the other side. That would 0 and 3 would make that positive 3. And then I'm going to divide by 5. Okay, so notice that's not going to divide out too well. And notice what else is not really nice either is 3 and 5 aren't perfect squares. So this isn't going to work out very pretty. Now, we're going to take the square root of both sides and recall kind of what we did on the other example. When we did a fraction, we took right there the square root of the numerator and the square root of the denominator. Okay, so I'm going to do that right here. Now, the only difference is 3 and 5 are not perfect squares, and they don't simplify either. Okay, So all I'm going to have there is the square root of 3 over the square root of 5. Now, that looks like, you know, okay, so you just have a square root as an answer. But recall here that there's going to be something wrong with this. We can't have, y'all probably already recognized it, you can't have a square root in the denominator. So what I'm going to have to do with this answer there is I'm going to have to rationalize it. Okay, so all this stuff that we learned about radicals about a month ago is now kind of coming back to us here. So we're going to multiply by 
square root of 5 over square root of 5 and rationalize my answer. Now, I did the square root on both sides, so now I have to say plus or minus. Now, let's rationalize. Square root of 3 times square root of 5 would be square root of 15. And then square root of 5 times square root of 5 would just be 5. And so now I've got an answer, and it doesn't have a radical in the denominator. So this, this part would have been my unrationalized answer, which would not have been the simplest form. Okay, now let's look at some more examples here of the square root method. And we're going to look at some that have complex solutions. So look, look on page 273 here. I'm going to do example 7. Okay, so let's recall what complex numbers were. Remember, complex numbers, there's a poster in the back of the room, the red poster there that we pointed out before. Um, complex numbers combine the real with the imaginary, so they're in the form A plus BI. So really what you want to think about complex numbers is that some solutions to quadratic equations can be imaginary. So that complex idea means we could have some imaginary solutions, and we'll see that pop up. Now, let's take example seven and let's solve this one. Now, we're going to, again, isolate x squared right there. So I'm going to get rid of the 100. I'm going to subtract it from zero, and so that's going to make it over there negative 100. Now, again, before I take the square root on both sides, that's kind of jumping a little bit too early if you want to take the square root. you got to isolate x squared, so you got to, you got to divide by 4 there first. So now we're going to get x squared equals, and then negative 100 divided by 4 divides out pretty nicely. Divides out to a nice perfect square there too, except for it's negative. So it's going to be negative 25. And now I'm going to take the square root on both sides. But now here's where the imaginary numbers are going to come in. So the square root of negative 25, well, the square root of 25 would be 5. But we should remember from our complex numbers here, the square root of negative 25 would be 5i. And there again, if I take the square root on both sides, it's really not just 5i, but it would be plus or minus 5i. Okay, now let's look at another one here. And this time, let's look at one that doesn't really turn out as nice. Okay, let's try this one. I think this is um, this one I've made up here. So there again, we're going to isolate the x squared. So we're going to get rid of 36. So we're going to subtract 36 from both sides. So 0 minus 36 is going to give me negative 36 over there. Okay, now let's isolate the x squared. We're going to divide by 2. And again, notice there's no linear terms here. This is why I'm using the square root method. So negative 36 divided by 2, that does divide out nicely for me, and that gives me negative 18. But notice 18 is not a perfect square. Now, let's take the square root on both sides. Okay. Now, that's going to be imaginary again, or a complex solution, because you're taking the square root of a negative number. But let's notice 18, it's really not, or I squared 18 is not going to be my final answer. I can simplify the square root of negative 18. I can use negative 9 times 2. Okay, and so that would simplify to 3i square root of 2. And I took the square root on both sides, so I'm going to say plus or minus 3i square root of 2. Okay, let's look at sort of one more here. All right, let's look at this one. This one's not going to turn out very nice at all here. All right, we're going to subtract the 50 over from both sides, so we can isolate. 0 minus 50 would be negative 50. And then we're going to divide by 7. Okay, so notice negative 50 doesn't really divide by 7 too well. Okay, it doesn't divide and it doesn't reduce either. Okay, now let's take the square root of both sides. And you remember the fraction idea. When I do the fraction, we'll do both the numerator and the denominator. Okay, now let's take the square root here. Now I can simplify 50. Okay, so with 50 I could use negative 25 times 2. So that would be 5i square root of 2. So we get plus or minus 5i square root of 2. 
And then I can't simplify square root of 7, so I'm just going to bring it down. So it looks like I have an answer there. But that answer is not in the simplest form because we can't have a radical in the denominator. So what I'm going to do, we did one earlier like this. We're going to have to rationalize it. So we're going to have to multiply by square root of 7 over square root of 7. And then I should have a decent answer. So 5i square root of 2 times square root of 7, really all we're going to do is multiply 2 times 7 and get 14. So this will give me 5i square root of 14. And then in the denominator, square root of 7 times square root of 7 would just be 7. And I'm going to bring down or bring over my plus or minus sign there. Okay, that's probably about as bad as it gets here with the square root method is you could come out with an answer that would be imaginary. And plus, with taking square roots, eventually you're going to run into some here where you're going to have a square root in the denominator. And so you're going to have to rationalize those answers. Now, the ones that you're going to have to rationalize in your assignment are going to be more so on page 274. Okay, so put in your notes there. You know, when you get to page 274, you probably want to look at this example and then the other one that we had to rationalize with. Now, let's do this. I want you to look on, let's go back and let's look on page 266 at numbers 13 through 18. Okay, again, this is a page 266, all right, numbers 13 through 18. I'm going to look at these in the document camera here. Now, on 13 through 18 there, they ask you to solve these, these quadratic equations, but they say solve by factoring or by taking square roots. So again, this is, this is where this unit is going to get to a point where you're going to have to decide which of the five methods to use. Now, we've only talked about two of them so far, factoring and square roots. So when I approach a problem here like number 13 or number 16, I've got to know which method to use. So recall what we said. We're going to use factoring when we have a linear term. And then we're going to use the square root method when we don't have a linear term. So let's just look at two of these. I'm going to let you decide on the rest of them here. But let's look at, say, number 13 and number 16. Okay, so on number 13, notice it says x squared minus 4x. Okay, so 13 has a linear term. So if it has a linear term, that means I'm going to use factoring. Okay, so if I've got a linear term, I'm going to use factoring on number 13. And what you could do there if you have trouble factoring that, I'm not going to do it for you here, but you could factor out a common factor of x there. And then you could probably solve it from there. Now, let's look at number 16. So notice on 16, you have 3x squared equals 48. And notice you don't have a linear term. You don't have one that just has a plain old x. So because 16 is missing the linear term, that means we would use the square root method on number 16. So it's all about the linear term. If I have the linear term, I'm going to use factoring. If I don't have the linear term, then I'm going to use square roots. Now, you can go ahead and start the assignment here. You have to actually start back on 7 or whatever the board says over there to your right. I don't really recall at this time what it was. 